Yeah, an interesting thing about drugs is it often, when a new drug is discovered, <clears throat> it takes a long time to figure out what is the, how do you do it? For example, hashish in the 19th century was always eaten. It was, that was how you did it. It was inconceivable. And if you read the descriptions of those trips, it was as psychedelic as anything. I mean, if you read Fitzhugh Ludlow or Bayard Taylor's descriptions of hashish intoxication written in the 1850s, they are no less Baroque and grandiose and psychedelic than uh, Tim Leary's descriptions <coughs> in the 60s. We smoke cannabis. Uh, this seems to be what had to happen to cannabis to change it into a social drug, uh, a drug uh, that you could play music on or be in a club on. A coca is an interesting one because coca, the leaf, is a very important part of the lives of the people who use it. Uh, Tim Plowman did research that showed that they were getting... Uh, 20 to 15 percent of their nutritional base was coca. It's a food. It's a food. And in the high Andes, where the temperature is very low, you can't live without coca. It keeps you warm. Uh, if you go to cocaine, this is a, a addictive and fairly pernicious drug but not nearly as addicting and pernicious if you take it all the way to free base. Well, cocaine had been around for a hundred years before anybody turned it into free base, and then, of course, it becomes crack cocaine. Now we're seeing the same phenomenon with methadrine. You know, motorcycle gangs and people like that love crystal meth, but now they're cooking it down to a free base and producing this stuff called ice, which is a much more pernicious and dangerous drug and very hard on your heart. So uh, uh, cultures relate very differently to these things and it takes a while to figure out how to do them. In the 60s, if you didn't take 500 micrograms of LSD, you weren't a player. In the 90s, these little tabs and, and pieces of paper handed out in clubs have 50 to 70 micrograms. I talk to my son's friends and they're all excited about LSD and they have these little 50s and I say, well, why don't you take 10 of them? <laughs> you know, and have a 500 mic trip. They say, you must be nuts. Nobody would do that. Behind you. He's had his hand up a long time. And I just wonder, taking the position so um, commonly that you do about, about psychedelics, are you not concerned about the government sort of Cracking down on you to make an example of them? Yeah, no, not really. I mean, there, we still have a constitution the last time I looked. And uh, I think if they were going to shut me down, they should have done it years ago. Uh, I, to me, it's a, it's a religious freedom issue. Uh, I don't think these things are obligatory, that you must do them to be a complete human being. That's preposterous. But <clears throat> it's an option. And it's part of uh, freedom. I mean, governments are very uncomfortable with freedom. If sex could be outlawed, they would outlaw it. Uh, ecstasy in all forms makes them very nervous and unsettled. Uh, right, because if, if we were all tripping on a daily basis in the U.S., I mean, surely the writing on the wall is that we would, I mean, the U.S. would fall apart because nobody could go sit in a corporate cubicle anymore. Right. Just the awesome. <laughs> Well... <laughs> We, we have a funny way of thinking about drugs. I mean, for example, uh, imagine if in 1948 a drug had been introduced into this country so addictive, so powerful, that uh, within a few years every single citizen was spending six hours a day loaded to the gills on this drug. Well, then everybody would say, we just went around the bend and blew out as a society. Well, but in 1948, television was introduced, and uh, 
millions and millions of people lead larval, low awareness, warehoused lives, mainlining an electronic drug straight into their brain. It has a whole profile. Blood pools in your ass, uh, your eyes <laughs> glaze over, your brain states can be recognized as those of a television watcher, uh, your digestion goes to hell, your eyes are shot, uh, and we think nothing of this because we call it a technology, not a drug. We have very strong categorical imperatives operating here. Uh, <clears throat> I would argue that it's almost better to do heroin than to watch TV. At least when you're doing heroin, you're responsible for your own reveries and... Uh, and thought processes. When you're mainlining TV, what is it but endless messages to fetishize products and to basically transfer your your uh, allegiance to various objects, which then can be sold to you? Yeah. How did you get a hold of Jerry Mander's book, uh, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television, which I was reading when I started Food of the Gods, and then blissfully found it in your autobiography when I got to that section of the book that you had read it from the, your section on TV. Well, I've always... Is it out of print now? It is out of print, yeah. I, I've always been interested in television from a McLuhanist point of view. Uh, I think a woman named Marie Wynn wrote a book called The Plug-In Drug in which she went much farther than Jerry Mander because w he... W-Y-N-N? No, W-I-N-N the plug-in drug. And she talks about the neurophysiological changes that accompany watching television and, you know, the dumbing down that occurs in the television environment. Uh, well, we didn't get as far as I hoped we would this morning, but we're now on the edge of technology with this discussion. And uh, we will proceed with all this at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Probably that was enough talk about strange drugs and states of mind this morning unless somebody has some burning agenda. Pharmacotheon. Yeah, I was mentioning to somebody, there uh, right now in the bookstore here, there seems to be an excellent inventory of drug books. Uh, all of Ott's stuff, including ayahuasca analogs, all of my stuff, Stolaroff's book, uh, Dale Pendel's new book, the reprint of Ernst von Biedra's book, a whole bunch of stuff there gathered in one place. So if you're looking for that stuff, uh, avail yourself of it. Some of those things are somewhat hard to find. Besides your books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, that book... It, Here's one. This is a good read. That's a good read. There's a book called Hallucinogens and Shamanism, edited by Michael Harner, that is a lot of different articles uh, behind in one set of covers, articles on ayahuasca, on Tabernanthi Boga, I believe on peyote, on solanaceous plants. It's a good general intro, and that's uh, just uh, one book, you, and it's there, I noticed. Well, so... Uh, if you have no issues, then it's up to me. Is there anything anybody wants to talk about or that I... Yes. Well, the, the argument for the time wave, the psychological argument, is that it's an argument against anxiety of a certain unfocused sort because it, uh, it makes a certain kind of generalized prediction about the future. It tells you where the improbable events are likely to cluster and where they are not likely to be encountered. It doesn't say what will happen, but it tells you where to look for interesting and uninteresting events. As you live with it and you confirm for yourself that it works, if you do, then your confidence will grow. Has mine? Well, maybe I put it too gently last night. Uh, there is now on the table something called the Watkins objection. 
which is hideously difficult to understand, but if sustained, uh, probably uh, catastrophic for this theory. How do I feel about the Watkins objection? About, about oh. the whole time wave thing at this point. Well, my... Uh, the time wave... <coughs> actually, we're sort of ahead of ourselves. Is a theory I have about how things work that we will look at tonight in considerable detail. So what's on the table right now is a discussion about this objection to it, that after 25 years of pleading for criticism, someone has come forward with a very complicated criticism, which may or may not be devastating, (coughs) and to decide whether it's devastating or not, you have to know a lot about it, more than is to be expected of anybody here. Uh, In the next months, this will all be thrashed out at the website. In other words, I will write a defense. Watkins will restate the objection and the formulas that back it up. Ralph will weigh in. Broadwell will weigh in, who was the primary programmer. Peter Meyer will weigh in, who was the C++ implementer. And we will all try and figure out whether this is shit or shinola that we have on our hands. Does that excite you? I mean, is that something that you look forward to, that process? Well, I wept at first uh, (laughs) for for entirely personal reasons having to do with my uh, alimocinary and uh, financial situation. After I had absorbed it, I realized, uh, no, no, it isn't that it's finished. It's that this is the beginning of the real battle. That before, it's just this, it was, it was my conjecture, unopposed by anybody. And nobody has ever been able to make an objection that lasted longer than 30 seconds. Watkins uh, put his finger on a very sensitive area where I myself have had doubts. And so now what I have to do is go back to Hawaii and in my very slow and plodding way, in my non-mathematical way, I have to sit with the problem and sit with these four-dimensional objects and rotate them in my mind and try and sort through the mathematics, the epistemology, the ontology, the experimental method, the nature of falsification, etc., etc., and decide where we are with this. Uh, So far, I'm the most alarmed person. Uh, Ralph said, (laughs) you know, it's just the Watkins objection, and then told a story about René Tom, who created a whole system of mathematics called catastrophe theory, which then came to a screeching halt when another mathematician came forward with an objection which to the two of them were devastating, but no two other people have really grokked what the point was exactly. Uh, So this all has to be sorted out, and it's sort of what I dreamed of. Uh, My assumption, my personal assumption about the time wave is that it will fail in 2012 and that then the rest of my life will be spent answering the not earth-shaking but epistemologically interesting to me question, why did it seem to work for so long? You know, what was the nature of my psychology or the pattern itself or the context of the world that with all my epistemological antennae extended and all my razors sharpened, I still went down the same primrose path as all these screwballs I deride all the time. (laughs) And that's a very interesting question. It has to do with you know, the nature of truth and delusion and evidence and feedback and so forth and so on. Well, so suppose then that the Watson objection is sustained and we all agree that he found this enormous hole. 
uh, well, then the disconfirmation of the, of the theory has arrived not in 2012, but in 96. Well, so then we can just move immediately on to this question which I anticipate, which is, why did it seem to work so long? I realize, and Watkins was at pains to point out to me, he, that a lot of people who don't understand this theory take it very seriously. What they take seriously is the prediction that in 2012, at a certain day, at a certain time, this transformation will occur. Well, it's fine to take the prediction seriously, but if you, unless you understand the premises, it's no different from the guy who says the ocean is going to move to Arizona and the guy who says the continents are going to reverse and the person who predicts the magnitude 8 quake on L.A. I, I, predictions are never interesting in and of themselves. <clears throat> What's interesting is the method. How did you, why do you think there will be a magnitude 8 quake in L.A.? If angels tell you this, I'm, I don't care, you know. But if you tell me that by taking the circumference of the earth and the distance of the sun and the inverse square ratio of the weight of the planet and dividing by a polynomial of C, then I'm interested. <laughs> uh, you know, that method. Still bullshit. Oh, no, it could easily be bull bullshit, but there's a way to find out. If angels tell you, what do we know from angels? The demons are of many kinds, you know, and some speak horseshit. So, yeah. When you contemplate, say you're going to go back to Hawaii and contemplate all this, do you, are, are, what role do psychedelics or do you think the psychedelics play in that contemplation for you? Or they? Oh, well, first I will... Is there a companion question that goes with that? Sure. I mean, let me ask you an obvious question. Is it, uh, was it necessary for you to explore and be a test pilot in order to come up with the theory in the first place? I want to know the other end of his question. Well, the other end of his question is a 210-page book called True Hallucinations. Yeah, well, it, it tells you the, the sweat-on-the-brow tale of how this stuff got figured out. Yeah, no, first I'll think about the problem, <clears throat> and then I'll take psilocybin and think more about the problem. It has to do with the a very complicated mapping question having to do with whether or not a twist from positive to negative values at a certain point in the process is logically constrained or not. That's all I can tell you at this moment. Those of you who are hackers and have hacked the code, if you want to see me afterwards, I can say more about it, but there's no reason to bore other people with it. But it's a technical detail, the potential for a mistake uh, is there. And I have always said, you know, that I would not go the route of the squirrels, that I could handle disconfirmation, that I'm more scientist than um, guru and pontificator. You see, the great thing about science is it's the only human enterprise where you get points for proving you're wrong. You know, that's as good as proving you're right. And you get as much respect from your colleagues. And it, it's a strangely ass-backward way to move into knowledge, but it's the only way anybody ever found whereby you can keep going indefinitely. If you, if you have other theories of knowledge inevitably turn into a dogma, a closed system of axiomatic propositions that answer all objections... Uh, <clears throat> so is the short answer that, to some extent, at least generally, yes, psychedelics played a role in the development of the theory? Yeah, absolutely. You to try to use psychedelics, specifically psilocybin, to... To go back. Objection. Yeah. Okay. Could you ask the mushroom just flat out, you know, here's this objection? This guy What's the deal? What's the deal? Yeah. Of course. Uh... Watkins Oh yes. No, no. Watkins. Watkins is a worthy opponent. Uh, <clears throat> Watkins is young. I, I, I dared not ask how young. Uh, 
a, 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 a child, a, 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 a savant of some sort. Uh, and he was not aggressive. He was gentle. He was respectful. Uh, we met because I had a theory of how we could use the time wave to explore extremely high prime numbers. So it was to explore a collaboration. But then we sat down there by the swimming pool with his yellow notepad, and he began to talk. And uh, it, it became clear immediately that, you know, the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who had come before were as nothing uh, compared to this, this one <coughs> English guy. Who, Has he published anything? Oh, no, he has no fixed address. He's, uh, he's a homeless person with a very sharp pencil. <coughs> Did that happen here? No, no, it happened at Palenque. Uh, Will this upcoming discussion uh, be available to other people to read on the web? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it'll be there. It'll be under, there's a page called Novelty. And if you go there, there are all kinds of exhibits, pro and con, the time wave. And now there will be something called the Watkins Objection. Uh, and possibly under the heading, Autopsy of a Mathematical Hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> it's lots of fun, actually, all of this. You just can't take yourself too seriously. It's more fun for me, I think, than for my public, because my public is, tends toward mania and humorlessness in, in some percentage, which makes it all very scary then, I think. Uh, if you realize that we are inside some kind of literary construction, uh, this is... Actually, remember I mentioned last night about being in the Baz and how it was like a Fellini movie crossed with a Disney cartoon? Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking about that in bed last night, and I said, well, there was a simpler way to say it. The simpler way is, it's like a Vladimir Nabokov novel. Do you remember in Lolita, the movie as well as the novel, where he they go to this motel for their first encounter, and... Uh, 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 there is the, the manager of the hotel is uh, Mr. Harry Schwein, and he's he has a very pig-like face, and he's introduced by Peter Sellers, the Humbert Humber, the the Claire, Claire Quilty figure brings him over and introduces him to Humbert Humbert and says, "This is my very good friend, Mr. Mr. Harry Schwein," and the camera closes in and you see this pig-like face. Well. It, it was that level of spreading uh, grotesqueness that clues you to the fact that this is good writing. This is good writing. This doesn't just happen, this kind of stuff. This takes effort. Production values are high. And, uh, you know, who you are in all of this is a question worth finding out. This sort of has to do with this thing I've been talking about for a few months about about taking the conclusion that the world is made of language, which we've talked about for years, but realizing that what the implication of that is, is that you can hack it. You can hack it in the sense of that you can hack code. This is a magical understanding. The world is not given. It's not made out of physics. It's not a Newtonian machine running according to partial differential equations. It's a bunch of code. And you can hack it and make it uh, the way you want and, and rewrite the scripts and uh, change the whole situation around. Yeah. If, if that's true, and I, I was thinking about <clears throat> Uh, the last weekend you did here, you said that what you realize on a high dose of DMT is that the world is magic top to bottom. Um, if, if that's true, then and if you get if you realize that under the influence of something like that, why aren't we all just doing nothing but sitting here and like visualizing world peace? Well, this is the question: If the world is the way we say it is, why isn't it the way we want it to be? Right? I mean, what is this resistance? We are creating it, in fact. Is that what you mean? That it being magic that we are projecting it out there and creating it? 
Yes, but it isn't the ego that is doing this projecting. It, the ego is somewhat frustrated by the inherent, apparent momentum of the situation. It's not going. The ego has a different fantasy that is constantly being frustrated. The, the, my idea of enlightenment is when ego and Tao are fused mm. and Tao is perceived as ego. Mm. See? then everything happens with complete appropriateness. But until that fusion of Tao and ego takes place, then there's always resistance. Uh, Psychedelics have a lot to do with this in the sense that we've said many times in these groups, you know, if you really want out, there's nothing stopping you. The, the one thing about psychedelics is all these other spiritual disciplines, yoga, breath work, this, that, and the other thing, you drive with the gas pedal to the floor. In this discipline, there's a lot of emphasis on locating the brakes. Uh, <clears throat> we do not need to drive at full bore with our engine. It's all about throttling back, gearing down. Pace is everything. If you truly have the appetite for the transcendental, there's nothing stopping you from becoming utterly incomprehensible to who you are now and to all of us. You know, if you, if you move down a few miles down the beach and start taking psilocybin on a daily basis, eventually you can become the monk of Cold Mountain. And by eventually, I mean in the next 30 days. <laughs> and uh, you can move up onto the crags and dress uh, in, in skins and people will say, oh yes, we, we see him occasionally. Uh, he, Woodcutters have run across uh, signs of him in the woods. Uh, I find that very freaky to contemplate because I know how little barrier there is between me and that you just it's just a step away. Like when I take mushrooms in the Amazon, the, the thing I have to fight every time I do it is this, uh, it says, walk into it. Walk into the jungle. It is not what you think it is. It is not unfriendly. It is not dangerous. Go to it. Go now. And you're saying, you know, because you can, you can sort of see a fantasy of integration, but you don't know what would happen 12 hours out when you're now 20 miles into the bush, no way back, and the psilocybin wears off and night is falling and the big cats begin the nightly hunt. Well, uh, pardon me? Yes, well, the hope is then that you would rise to the occasion. But, you know, you're way, way out there on a limb. It may not be your occasion. Again, the other end of the same question would be, how does one explore, resist going into that jungle, and then when you come down and the psilocybin wears off, deal with business in the jungle that we have to deal with in an orderly fashion as you did before? How does one resist or throttle back to make sure you don't get incapable of coming back and attending to business so you can go back and explore some more? Well, I may not be the person to ask. <laughs> I, I mean, I, f- I find myself very conflicted. I, I, uh, 18 months ago, 20 months ago, I moved to Hawaii. And of course, it's paradisical. The flip side of that is it's insanely difficult to leave. I mean, uh, this is not exactly hell on earth. I mean, you people all paid a lot of money to be here. But from where I'm coming from, you know, it's level upon level of pressure and coldness and climatic shock. And I mean, I think of the mainland as Blade Runner land. 
It's uh, amphetamine land. It's availability land. It's strontium-90 land. It's newt land. It's, uh, you know, uh, just a, a horrific scene. And I don't know whether this is good or bad. I'm getting to the place where I, I could very easily never leave that hill. And it's not an abandonment of the world because uh, I have the Internet. I go everywhere. I see hundreds of people and exchange email with thousands of people. But uh, the actual tumult of the thing seems crazy-making. And even my own uh, wake seems crazy to me. I find it very hard to disentangle myself from this end of the millennium squirrely mentality that's breaking loose where, you know, angels whisper on every street corner and half the people walking around have alien implants and uh, the other people are channeling dead relatives. And uh, I call this uh, the balkanization of epistemology. Uh, Everything is is uh, everything is becoming uh, balkanized into various cults of meaning that have no communication with other cults of meaning. And so people retreat into closed communities of dogma and assumption. And uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite bizarre and accelerating rapidly. And the only thing I see mitigating that Uh, are psychedelics, again, which dissolve boundaries. But I also see that the path that the psychedelics seem to be, (coughs) the path by which the psychedelics are moving toward a kind of quasi-respectability is by uh, making some kind of hellish marriage with organized religion. And, and that's very dubious, you know. That will dumb it down and turn it into uh, cults of personality and so forth and so on. So it's a very complicated situation. Uh, what I try to convey to people is the only way to make sense of reality is to keep your mind clear. And to do that, you have to take drugs because social programming otherwise is so strong that you're just walking around inside of some kind of Pavlovian nightmare that's being handed down from Time Warner. Uh, So logical razors, a real emphasis on direct experience, and a fairly in-your-face, show-me attitude. Because uh, in the spiritual marketplace, all kinds of claims... Uh, are are being made. Do you find do you find for yourself any reason to leave your hill other than perhaps the need to come out and earn a living? No, not really. N- not really. So you could see yourself as a cyber monk of War Mountain. <laughs> Well, uh, I was billing myself as the zone ghost of cyberspace. Uh, you know, that that is the way to do it, I think. Uh, and I think more and more this is happening, that what I've discovered is a lifestyle. The way it feels is that we live there, we live in the future. We live in nature, a climaxed Pacific Island rainforest. We have a wireless connection to the Internet that is run on superb machinery that is run by the sun. Uh, There are no wires in, no wires out. Uh, A four-wheel drive road so terrible that there's no motivation to go by petrol-powered device to and from town. And the whole world is available through the Internet. Uh, most uh, cities and office culture and suburbs, all these things are genuflections to the constraints of three-dimensional space on social styles. Most people have now, if they understand the Internet, no reason to live where they're presently living. And as soon as big corporations actually do the cost-benefit analysis, they're going to <clears throat> buy everybody computers and tell them to stay home. And office culture will disappear. 
corporations will become invisible, dispersed, dissipative structures, globally encompassing, locally focused where they need to be. People will be able to sell their skills in a global environment. The entire planet becomes a local telephone call. This is upon us. The, the, the speed with which the Internet is uh, supplanting all other forms of information transfer and technology is really freaky, especially considering that very f- if you're not hip to what's going on, nothing appears to have changed. You know, the world of 1996 looks pretty much like the world of 1993 except that in a hidden dimension, visible only through the screen, everything has changed. Everything has changed. And, you know, it's steepening the social pyramid. It's empowering political, social, sexual minorities and margins. Uh, It is dissolving boundaries very much as a psychedelic drug dissolves boundaries and I've said here you know in a way drug design is the first and most successful to date branch of nanotechnology I mean when you design a drug what you are designing is a tiny molecular machine designed to go into the environment of the nervous system and interact with the structures it finds there and produce a desired result and and you know atom by atom drugs are designed and built up Uh, the only difference between computers and drugs at this point is one is too large to swallow (laughs) and we're working on that well I think the moment before this communication becomes uh, virtual and completely convincing is just a technological millisecond. I mean, by the turn of the century, the net will not look anything like it looks now. Everybody will have T1 and higher speed, and everyone will be moving through extremely complex, virtually designed environments. So all this objection to the interface is is just a, it's a, just an engineering problem it's on its way to solution as we speak right now the the hardwired machinery the the performance limit of the hardware has never been tested the software is not taking advantage of the hardware the software is not as good as it should be this is a human design problem we're not waiting for technological breakthroughs we're waiting for better code writers more creative code so eventually what we're saying is at some point the technology will be able to and completely synthesize well, in a sense, you know, we, there's this big whoop de doo about virtual reality and how radical a concept this is. The first virtual reality was Ur. I mean, once you move be- behind city walls and, and into language and begin to have social values and religious beliefs and classes and costuming and architecture. This is all virtual reality. It's just being engineered in very resistant media, like stone, for example, uh, rather than building it out of light, as you do in a VR thing. But virtual realities are what we build. I mean, telling stories around the campfire 20,000 years ago. What's the concept? Close your eyes. Follow the voice into the three-dimensional modality of the storyteller's world. Uh, What's happening is uh, that we, through technology and through slight sophistication of our epistemological tools, are noticing what we're doing. We've discovered that media is not this completely transparent, neutral, friendly thing, but that in fact every form of media shapes culture, shapes social values, shapes the individual mind of the user. The psychedelic experience is so shocking to people, and that's what it means to be straight.
not in the sense of sexually straight, but in the other meaning, in the sense of uh, straight as opposed to freaky. I mean, straight people cannot handle the decompressed, fuzzy, limited, uh, unlimited, boundaryless stuff of reality. I'm sure you've seen uh, uh, these bumper stickers that say reality is for people who can't handle drugs. Uh, Well, there's something to this. Uh, Reality is a safe island in an ocean of much more ambiguous possibilities. But is reality safe when cyberspace and the internet and television are married? Who's going to have control? Well, television is not... A tel- there will always be TV, and just like there will always be airplane glue and, uh, <clears throat> you know, scuzzy drugs. People have to make choices. The it, it, Large numbers of people choose the larval, low-awareness... Aw- feed of TV, but they also have no taste and have no ambitions and no expectation of the future. I mean, television is not an enormous intrusion into their existence. It sort of completes the flatness of it. The thing is to make other options available for those who want it. When I was growing up, I watched a lot of TV because so did everybody else. There were no other options. Now, there are many, many options. And uh, uh, the most exciting thing is nobody need experience a sense of isolation. Uh, you, you know. What I'm trying to say is, what about when, the, if, when everyone's online? I don't know if I did. Someone in the room must have the same fear. When everything's online, and the eye looks both ways into everybody's domicile, wherever it is, in the rainforest or the middle of an urban development. How will that be different from 1984? How will that? How will we retain the freedom of choice? How will we make sure that the Constitution's in place? What will be our chance? Well, in 1984, see, there's a distinction here uh, that's important about media. Uh, We are only familiar with and have grown up, all of us, under the aegis of what is called mass media. Mass media means television, newspapers, radio. And what mass media is, is one-to-many communication. Uh, The editors of Time magazine, a team of 50 or so people at the top, communicate to millions of people, similarly network broadcast executives. The Internet is different. It's what's called any-to-any communication, not one-to-many. And mass media has created, since the Renaissance, since the invention of print, the entire notion of what is called the public. We are so familiar with this idea, the public, I'm part of the public, you're part of the public, we're the public, that we don't realize that before 1640 there was no such thing as the public. The public is created by mass media and it will disappear with the disappearance of mass media. A a way to understand this is to realize that the New York Times and the London Observer are as much tabloids as the trashiest and sleaziest of the alien abduction, uh, Christ seen at the supermarket, Elvis uh, uh, at prayer kind of thing. Because, necessarily so, because the New York Times must be understood by millions of people. Anything which must be understood by millions of people is so hopelessly divorced from how it is that it becomes a form of fiction. This is hard for us to get used to because we say, well, the the public or the public opinion is, and we have to have informed public opinion. We have never had informed public opinion. It's a fiction. You know, P.T. Barnum said nobody ever went broke by underestimating the taste of the American people. (laughs) Truth, (laughs) truth, yeah. It seems to me kind of like the discovery of the atom in the sense that there was tremendous potential 
for positive uses, but just as much tremendous potential for destructive or, or counter creative or counterproductive uses. And it seems to me like when you've got more and more people spending more and more time in front of a screen mm. instead of, instead of more and more time out in nature or with other people, that while something may be gained, something very important may also be lost. And the, the downside may be that, that on the one hand, you have more and more people physically isolated from other people, emotionally isolated from other people, and more and more people who become, their, their life, their internal experience becomes like a, being a big head, and what your body is there for is to carry your head around. Well, I feel the force of that, but on the other hand, uh, throughout most of human existence, people have related to a very small group of people. We are the first generation in history to be totally comfortable with Shinjuku Station at rush hour or Grand Central Station at rush hour. I think uh, probably relating to 40 or 50 people in a neighborhood is about all the emotional uh, stretching anybody needs and the idea that you have to have vast numbers of face-to-face -face relationships with doorman, taxi drivers, people who serve you food, people who you serve food, and so forth and so on. It, it's not really consistent with how people have lived their lives most of the time. I don't like the artificiality of the technology, but I, I'm very confident that that's a passing phase. Uh, then what? Then you have people's faces on the screen? Yeah. It's still another step removed from direct experience. Well, here's what I, here's what I imagine as a reasonable engine, a short-term engineering goal for 2006, let's say. This would cost a trillion dollars, but you'd make fifty trillion dollars if you brought this to market in good shape. Uh, and this is not a nanotech fantasy. This is simply, this is within reach. Imagine uh, an invention which looks like a pair of black contact lenses, but actually is uh, implants which are put into the inside of your eyelids uh, at some point in your life. Well then, uh, when you close your eyes like this, these implants come down over your retina, and what you see are menus hanging in space. What you're seeing is an interface into the net, the web, or the whatever it's called. And uh, by moving your eyes in certain ways, you can turn on switches and move through this interface. Virtually what has happened is that the entire cultural dynamism has become invisible. And you can be naked and live in a rainforest and dig for yams with a pointed stick if you want. And when you've got enough yams, you can close your eyes and visit the Vatican Library exhibit on Renaissance mathematics that is running at the Vatican Library website. Or anything else uh, and the vast gamut of sexual, uh, intellectual, uh, industrial, and so forth, tools that are laid before you on the internet. So <clears throat> that's a reachable goal. Uh, well, here's what it does. See, my analysis is that what's killing the world is not the internet. What's killing the world is addicting people to objects uh, that we have to fabricate raw materials into these objects in order to supply people with these things. Mercedes and uh, condos and VCRs and high fashion gowns and so forth and so on. If we could, uh, which would you rather have? Uh, you know, an 800 square foot, uh, $500,000 condominium in Malibu, which is real, or uh, the entire palace of Versailles with obedient staff on call 24 hours a day in virtual space. 
I think most people would go for Versailles. I think what we have to do is convince people that matter is tacky. And the way you convince people matter is tacky is by making the virtual world so beguiling that uh, people think that the actual acquisition of objects is a manifestation of ill breeding and bad taste. Uh, so, and, and that's just a switch in cultural values, you know. A moment ago you said, and this is something I want to jump on, because I, I was kind of objecting a little bit like you were there about the loss of humanity, but what I also heard you say, just briefly, is that all we need is 30, 40, 50 people. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, with all this technology, and for me, all the technology of the next thousand, thousand years will not replace the human spirit. You can't send that in the lines. But besides that, uh, you're still advocating small communities, small, non-materialistic, small communities. So you still will have that. Yes, I think most people can make their living from local forms of agriculture. Tribalization, I mean, there are some things about population that have to be talked about, too. But some of you know, I've suggested this idea of one woman, one child, which is a very simple idea and which would collapse the world population by 50% in 30 years. Uh, and uh, people say, well, but women wouldn't voluntarily limit their reproductive activity. Well, maybe not in Bangladesh and Java, but where we really want people to hear this message is in Manhattan and Malibu, because the children of those women use 800 to 1,000 times more resources than the children born to women in Bangladesh. Convince one woman on the Upper East Side of Manhattan not to have a child, it's the equivalent of convincing a thousand people in Bangladesh not to have a child. If you could get 15% of the educated upper class women of the industrial democracies to voluntarily have one child, within 10 or 15 years, you would begin to see the indices fall back into the black on the resource extraction curve. So uh, uh, th this is... Uh, uh, my theory of politics is you can only get people to do things that are good for the community if they are also good for the individual. So if you go to someone and preach poverty and self-sacrifice, who's interested in that? But if you go to a, a, an educated woman in the high-tech industrial democracies and say, how would you like to have uh, cradle-to-the-grave medical insurance? How would you like to have genuine status as a hero in the struggle to save the earth? And how would you like to have vastly increased leisure time and vastly increased disposable income. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Social esteem, more money, more time, less responsibility, and high status. Uh, so you persuade the individual then to act in a way which supports uh, the goals of the community. And then beyond that, there are other issues. I mean, I would advocate a limiting of male birth. I think it's crazy to try and feminize men. I think that's so weird. And that if we as a collectivity feel that there is not enough femininity in our uh, society, then we should have more women, not feminize men. And I would argue that the 50-50 ratio among the sexes is actually an artificially maintained ratio enforced by patriarchy. And that if resources and <clears throat> nurturing and care were equally distributed, there would be closer to a 75-25 uh, ratio of, or 70-30 or, or ratio men to women, yeah. A couple of these questions that were really touching upon perhaps a dehumanization relating to information transfer. Uh, I thought something important to add to that is a smaller number of relationships will become much, much richer. So sure, we'll be globally connected, but our community will 
the depth and the levels of community will be so much beyond what there can be now. And I, I just look at it uh, from the standpoint of food production. There's already food being shipped around because of the petrochemical industry. Thousands of miles in refrigeration, completely disconnected from uh, a richness which comes from local resources and local community. And the reason why I believe people in Malibu or, or Manhattan be, or in Manhattan will uh, be moving in these directions more is because it's it's a higher quality of life, more mindful, more spiritual, and uh, they can afford to live a simpler lifestyle. The people who are in the midst of the machine, they don't have the time to even think about it. Yes, what's very disturbing about all of this, you're right, some people are figuring it out. What's disturbing is that since the collapse of uh, the socialist critique of capitalism, Capitalism is absolutely unrestrained and uncriticized, and it is raising in the hearts of hundreds of millions of people in the third world a desire for a middle-class lifestyle that cannot possibly be delivered unless we cut every forest, dig every mine, and uh, fabricate everything into consumer electronic goods. Exactly, and, and, and the problem with, with imagining some voluntary or other population control is it's not going to happen until it's economically driven, because right now our economy is based on expansion. And so all of the dominators want that. They want expansion, more consumers, so they can make more products, so they can mine more minerals and, and add value, you know. Well, clearly, though, this can't go on forever. There, there is a resource limit that is, uh, has come into view. But, but are any of these people that, that are currently in charge of General Motors or Ford or any of are they are they really planning for that? Are they, are they making allowances well, I think for that? It's happening, it's happening already. I mean, all with them. all the downsizing, who's going to buy cars? I mean, the market for cars is diminishing right here in this country. I think they're going to come face to face with it by necessity. They're, high, they're, they're, fight, they're getting rid of the people who they need to buy the cars right here in this economy. So I think it's going to come on the roost. And the opportunities are shifting over away from products that are made out of matter to the products that are made out of bits right. rapidly. And, and so the, the so economic development energy is following that opportunity because they're closing out where you have to cut the trees and Great. So now they're making more and more products out of less and less matter. Well, that's a good idea. Well, it's great. And then the ultimate thing is let's make everything out of cyberspace and then we can all live there. And now we're totally removed from the Earth. Well, there are... Now does the planet recover because we're not raping it anymore? We no, you'll have more time. We've been in we the garden. There's that's cyberspace right. now. We can, <laughs> we can build forests and chop them down and sell them? You mean in cyberspace? Yes. Well, a cyberspace doesn't work quite like that. Uh, you know, somebody said in virtual reality, the difference between a 10-story building and a 100-story building is one zero. That's how you make a 10-story building 100 stories high, one zero. It costs nothing. You build with light. You build with numbers. There is no constraint uh, we're so used to resource constraint, the constraints of gravity, the constraints of the tensile strengths of materials and all that. Imagine what we would build if we could build in the architectonic style of our own imagination. I, I think technology is not under the control of the people who are developing it. I mean, here's an interesting thought. You, you could have a completely cyberspatial world and it could look like the Italian Renaissance. I think that the horse is going to make an enormous comeback. Once people don't have to commute to cities, once people distribute themselves across the land, once people are involved in agriculture again, but you have to realize there are many, many technologies simultaneously evolving. There's a whole angle on this that has nothing to do with cyberspace. It's sort of the revolution one compartment over. And it's called nanotechnology. If replicators for food, then fine. Food and water. Well, th this, they're working on it. They're working on it? Oh, sure. 
Sure. This is a design goal to essentially feed China on sea floor, floor sludge that is turned into basmati rice in matter compilers. Uh, people, people who don't take drugs believe this is possible. Uh, people like Eric Drexler and uh, that crowd. I mean, they see a world of nanosite machines, machines smaller than the eye can see, made of diamond that are transforming everything. Uh, this is a, a near-term engineering goal uh, up the coast, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't accept the premise of the lowest common denominator. I think if you look at history, let's say, on the scale of a thousand years, uh, most people today live better than kings 300 years ago, far better than kings. Uh, in terms of technical progress, the, the PGP encryption that I run on my computer gives me better security than Stansfield Turner had when he ran the CIA. Uh, it is not true that the good things of life are not accruing to more and more people. Now, uh, as the population grows, there are more and more people. Uh, in in some degree of misery, but they even at that, the masses of India are better informed through their daily newspapers and their television than kings were 300 years ago. So what I see happening is an unleashing of information. It's almost as though information is a kind of force. And we associate with it. We are the information-transducing ape. But after hundreds of thousands of years of transducing information into more and more complex forms, it has almost gotten out of us. It came down through our fingers and into the tools, and now our tools talk to us and seem to be getting smarter faster than we are. It's almost as though information has a will of its own to complexify and advance itself. And it doesn't care whether it uses DNA or human language or C++ to advance its agenda. Uh, the tools that we're producing are essentially the hardwiring of our own unconscious. We are bringing into consciousness the parts of ourselves that previously were uh, inaccessible. So it's not simply, you know, the payrolls of the corporations and the stock fluctuations around the world, but it's also the complete database of the culture is now digitized and online. We are becoming, and, and McLuhan said this, he said, he said, human beings are the genitals of information technology. They exist only to produce a better model next year. In other words, we are like the genetic component of this epigenetic process. But to pretend that it's alien from us is an argument to not speak English. You know, that's a technology. That's a way of information manipulation and retrieval that is uh, anti-human and not natural and very recently uh, invented. Uh, there's always a nostalgic looking back, but, uh, uh, you know, we're clearly, we're never going to herd our cattle again across the undulating plains of a grassland Africa. That party was cancelled long, long ago. And uh, somehow information, uh, self-reflection, cognitive process is synergizing itself to higher and higher levels and we can come along for the ride if we want and if we don't want then it's going on without us. Well, I think that the real, the real impact of the Internet is art and that we have not yet begun to communicate with each other. We are so used to small mouth noises and text that we are, st and we have the habits hammered into us by mass media, which are consumptive habits. We consume. You put somebody in front of a screen and they ask, 
can I play a game or what can I do? Well, the real answer is you can make something and communicate it. Uh, I was just gave an interview and I was saying my vision of the net, what I want to do, I have a whole agenda not related to anything I've been up to. Uh, I, years ago I used to paint and I used to say all of life was a preparation for painting. Uh, and I haven't actually painted since, I don't know, 1970 or something. But I'm about to essentially paint again. And what I mean by that is, uh, I, in response to your set of discomfortures, I'm troubled by the lack of the eroticization of the net. The net is not erotic enough. I mean, you can download pornography, but that's not really my idea of what an erotic net would look like. Uh, and uh, so take that and then couple it with this unique form of art that is, was invented in the 20th century, which is collage. You know, the Dadas were the first people to rip up subway tickets and restaurant menus and newspapers and glue it all down. Collage is a unique 20th century form of art, and uh, it deconstructs culture, and it has all kinds of adumbrations and echoes and resonances built into it. Hypertextualizing collage through image mapping to build vast, multi leveled, hyper collage like environments is something I want to do. And, and I want to use it to make the, the net a much sexier place. And I'm not interested in it as a commercial thing, uh, I'm interested in it as a, a communicative thing. Okay, so that's my one person's agenda for the net. Well, you might have a different take. You should do your version. Everybody should understand you now have this little place where you can build and display your dreams, whatever they are. Your private obsessions, your deepest fears, uh, you can appear as pretentious or as honest or as direct or as elusive uh, as you want. But there is this place now which is a window into your soul that you can put online. And uh, my website will become more and more me until it will be more me than I am because I will be a, a one-dimensional real-time slice of a much deeper online cross-indexed hypertextual me. Uh, and, and that will be the truer me and it lives forever, in a sense. They're already confronting the issue of what to do with the websites of dead people. And uh, generally, <coughs> uh, in, in many cases, they're just keeping them on. Uh, so, in a way, I think what we should each do is, it, it's as though we've changed suddenly uh, from slugs to snails. And what I mean by that is, now you can... Uh, construct a physical artifact out of your genetic unfolding, out of the experience of your life, such that when you move on, it will stay around. And people can say, well, what did he know? Did he have it figured out? What did he say about how you handle an affair with the senator's mistress? Did he know how to do that? Uh, and so forth and so on. And this becomes an enormous database for learning for understanding, uh, for feeling what it is to be human. And, you know, if there are parts of who you are that you are alienated from or that you think other people might judge harshly, then you can anonymize, you know, make it anonymous. Put yourself behind many levels of anonymity and then display whatever kink or peculiarity or crackpot idea or obsession uh, you wish. So I think in a way the monkey body, while it's been fine and is great for calisthenics and other activities, it, it shouldn't be uh, the be-all and end-all of defining what it is to be human. Uh, what it is to be human is to have a human body and a human mind 
integrated inside a human culture with a human future. And if any of those things are absent, then the human is not fully there.